B-B-O-T. This is a, a going to be, I think, a really exciting session, and it's going to be all about gesture and control and how we're exploring the interface in new ways. Uh, and I've just heard uh, a variety of stories about um, new technologies that are coming out that will really drive sensors and other things into the marketplace. So every aspect of your life, you'll be able, you might have an app for your chair, an app for your shower, an app for this, and you might be able to manage it. So these are some of the companies that you'll see who are innovating in that space. The person who will moderate this session is, a, is Steve Donahue, who I told you earlier is one of our columnists. And he's very passionate about this particular topic. So Steve, do you want to come up? Thanks, Thank you. He's also with Light Reading. OK, great. Thanks, Tracy. We've already heard um, a lot this morning about the potential of motion sensing technology. Gary Shapiro said he sees products like Microsoft's Connect as a prelude to an immersive TV future where content responds to the viewer. And Dustin Kelloff told us, um, showed us a demo of uh, how a TV viewer could shake or touch the screen of an iPad to, mani to manipulate characters in a TV show. Our panel features the leaders from some of the companies driving advances in motion sensing and uh, gesture-based uh, TV navigation. And I'm gonna, uh, we have uh, some great demos today and uh, not too much time to get through them, so I'm gonna introduce the panel. Uh, we have Dan Simpkins, the CEO of Hillcrest Labs. Iris Finkelstein Suggy, Director of, Mark, Director of Strategic Marketing at PrimeSense. Tim Kelleher is Senior Director of Engineering and Business Development at Movia. Rob Gerling is the pr principal at design firm Artifact. And Kevin Shaw is the CTO of Sensor Platforms. Uh, we're going to begin with a uh, demo from uh, Iris Finkelstein at PrimeSense. Iris? Everybody? Um, I'm going to stand up just to do a demo, um, and uh, the situation here is an optimum phone demo, so please excuse me in advance. Uh, it's a little tight in here. Um, so just starting off by talking a little bit about uh, what it is that we're trying to achieve at PrimeSense, and um, looking back at what I've uh, heard today in the last couple of hours, we've been talking a lot about content and interaction, how content is king and so on. And I think the problem that we're trying to solve is really um, the issue of how to access all of this content. How do you make it accessible? How do you make it so that people want to get to all this stuff that they're seeing out there on their screens? Um, and going back maybe 40, 50 years, if we're talking about the television of then, we had maybe a few channels. We had an on and off switch, which we would push with her finger. And we had this kind of dial, which we would turn to uh, get to the two or three channels that we had. Um, moving on maybe 10 or 20 years, we had 20, 30, 100, 400 channels, and we have this amazing contraption called a remote control where you can actually channel surf with your thumb again, up, down, left, right, and so on. Um, but today, and from what I've seen from the last session, smart TV, all of this content that's out there, um, the social networks, the internet, everything that you want to access, this is no longer television. This is everything really on this screen in your living room. And the old paradigms are, aren't really um, enough to be able to access all of this. So what do you do? How do you make it more natural, more intuitive? How do you get people to, be, to access things that they want without it being too difficult, um, too time intensive, too just frustrating, trying to find all of these buttons in the remote control? Um, so what we're doing here is actually, I don't know if you can see this behind me, good. Um, we're taking control of the screen on, on our living room just by moving our hands around. And now I'm gonna drop my hand for a second just so you can see what's going on here. So on the lower right hand of the screen, you can actually see what the sensor is seeing. And you're probably all familiar with the sensor. It's the uh, sensor that's behind the Microsoft Connect engine, of course. Um, so what you're seeing over there is actually a depth map. This is what the sensor is seeing right now. And you can see it's a little cut off because as I said, this is a little tight spot. It's not the usual type of living room that we aim for. Um, and if I raise my hand and actually take control of the television like this, then now you can actually see my borders. Okay, so you can see me moving my hand around and this is my screen right in front of me. So I know all the time where my hand is, where the controls on my television are. And it's as easy as doing a push and swipe on your tablet with a touch technology. 
Um, and a lot of people are talking today about touch technology as the next thing for the TV screen. But really, if you think about it, in your living room, sitting on a couch, maybe around here with your TV screen about 10, 15 feet away from you, you don't want to get up and do all of these things on a TV. Um, so we need to find a better, more natural, more intuitive way of doing these things um, that are similar in concept to what touch is all about. So again, taking control of my television, and what you see here is actually just a demo version of what we call a media center or smart TV application. Of course, it's um, not fully fledged. It has just a few features, just a few uh, applications in it so that you can actually see what we're talking about. And if I access, for instance, my music album, I can pick, a movie, pick a, an album, pick a, a record, play it, play around with the volume. I see we don't have volume here now for some reason. Do we? Yeah, we do. Okay. So I can play around with the volume. I can fast forward it and do all of the regular things I would do on any kind of music application. And then again, very easily, I'm taking control again, going back to my home screen, maybe browsing my picture album, selecting an image, and with very easy movements of my hand, flicking through the pictures. Now, one of the most important things when you're surfing and you want to access something is being able to search for it. And search is one of the most uh, problematic things that we're trying to solve today. Um, the remote control, of course, is not the right way to do it, but um, gesture control or motion technology is also very problematic in that aspect. Um, so just one example, and again, this is a demo application. So. This is just one example of how PrimeSense is trying to solve these kind of issues. So I can search by letter. RFL doesn't bring me anything, of course. Let's try again. Yeah, OK, so I'm going to go to F. OK, so you get my meaning, of course. Um, going back. We have the ability to access our games, of course, again, on our smart TV. I'm not going to do demos of games here because obviously I just don't have room to play here. Um, and we need the space to be able to see the entire body. So again, if you look at the right-hand corner down there, the depth map, you can't really see my legs, you can't see the top of my head, so that would be a problem. But I can also sit down and operate this, um, and it would be the exact same thing. So again, natural interaction, intuitive. Um, natural, uh, a new way, new paradigm of accessing uh, the infinite amount of content that's on your TV. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Uh, we're now going to hear from uh, Dan Simpkins, the CEO of uh, Hillcrest. Dan? Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. Um, so it's no secret, I think uh, everyone recognizes that the user interface for TV uh, that exists today is kind of a, a little bit uh, problematic in order to move into interactivity. I think Iris uh, just brought that up. Um, the fact is that uh, for the last 10 years, uh, Hillcrest has actually been working on advanced user interfaces uh, for television as well. And one of the key things that we've been able to develop is an extraordinarily sensitive um, and very precise uh, device, pointing device, that enables you to control your TV. Now, he here's the interesting thing. Um, what we saw in the 80s right, are that the addition of the mouse transformed computing. And what effectively a mouse was was a pointing interface. Why is pointing so important? Well, pointing is important because pointing is an instinctive human behavior. We actually learn to point before we learn to speak. By, by a year old, virtually all children can point to indicate selection even though they may be able to, uh, they may be unable to articulate it. What we then saw several years ago was the move to, to take pointing into the smartphone area. And so what we did was we transformed smartphones and made the natural, mo the natural movement or natural gestures uh, effectively a tool to control that experience. So the progression, the obvious natural progression is to move the instinctive pointing experience into television. Iris actually just demonstrated one way to bring pointing to TV, and I'm actually going to demonstrate a different way to bring pointing to television. So if we can actually bring, oh, we have it. Perfect. Okay. 
So what we have, and uh, interestingly, if you were in the last panel, um, Sam Chang of LG showed a remote control, this device, uh, which is essentially a high performance pointing interface. It's a remote control that just has a few buttons on it um, and it controls a cursor on screen. Now, from our perspective, a motion device um, has to be capable of moving a cursor or essentially transferring the hand to the screen in a, in a way that allows for 10 foot or lean back experiences. Um, what we wanted to do and what, what's important to us is to really be able to make the experience so natural you could do it with a beer in your hand, right, and the device in your other hand. What we also have found through cognitive research is people actually like to, to hold something, especially guys. We, we like to have a remote control. Um, but we want to make the remote control so effective, so easy to use, that just takes a very little bit of motion, teeny motion, to actually control the experience. Now, what you have here, what you're seeing, is a product that Hillcrest uh, launched about 15 months ago. It is the Kylo browser, and all of you actually uh, can go and download um, off uh, kylo.tv. Uh, you can download this. It's a free browser for uh, PCs and Macs. Now, what's different about it? This was intended for over-the-top use, where you want to connect a PC to the TV and navigate your TV from 10 feet away. So you see that the buttons are large, and you can uh, see them from a distance. But there are also some components of this that make it easy uh, to control um, the experience when you want to do um, the basic things that you need to do when you merge internet content or, or internet browsing with TV. So let's say I want to search for Glee. I actually don't want to type very much. I get a, um, a content-aware uh, search um, element or search engine that uh, understands uh, applications for television or, or entertainment content. And I was able to actually go uh, to this site and, and identify uh, some specific content that's interesting. Um, we uh, wanted to make this um, really easy to use that not only could you do um, in kind of an active lean forward mode, but actually I want to be able to make this possible to do this in a lean back mode. When I'm trying to hang it out and I don't want to actually get up and point at the screen. So I could go ahead to YouTube, pull up some YouTube video, um, hit a cursor um, in this uh, search area. You notice that my hand is really is resting on the couch. Um, and you can actually um, go ahead very easily, uh, very naturally, with very little effort, and um, go actually do a search. So here we are, we're looking for a particular um, video, and I'm going to click search. So you notice very high precision. I found the video, and I'm going to sit back. Hi, I'm Jim Gable from Progress Labs. We want to show you the new smart TV from LG Electronics that uses our free space motion technology for a new kind of remote control that adds point and click to a big screen TV. The LG is a great new TV by itself, and with the new pointer remote, you can change the channel by simply clicking on the different channels that you want to try. Also with the new motion technology, you can use the smart TV features and then point to the different items you want to use. Here's the new Amazon video app where you can watch TV shows and movies. As you can see, we now have full featured screens. For example, there are over 20 hotspots in the screen, but it doesn't feel crowded because you can simply point and click on what you want to do. When playing a film, you don't have to guess what the buttons on your remote are going to do. Instead, you just click on the bar on your screen. In fact, your eyes never leave the screen. You just click on what you want. Adding motion pointing to a TV enables new games that were not practical before. Even casual games, like this matching game, they're nearly impossible with the old up-down, left-right remotes. If not impossible, definitely no fun. The Magic Motion Remote is very precise and stable. You only need small wrist movements for full control. And it's RF based, so it works from anywhere in the room and in any kind of lighting. So with the new Smart TV from LG and the motion sensing technology from Hillcrest Labs, you can use the pointer to find Tron on the Voodoo movie service and sit back and watch the streaming 3D movie at home on your TV. 
So as you can see, moving um, the concept of pointing um, and a natural motion into the television experience really can be transformational. I think that's what this panel is all about. But I want to just conclude with one important point. Um, what we were showing here is an interface that uses a cursor, essentially transforms the mouse experience uh, to the TV. But you don't actually have to use uh, the cursor on screen. This device is a full um, multi-axis, uh, an essentially inertial navigation system in a remote control um, that allows you to do all sorts of um, uh, gestures and uh, motion-based input with or without the pointing uh, experience natively um, on the TV. And it's really up to the uh, TV OEMs, the set-top makers, and the technology, all of you, the technologists in the room, to figure out how to transform TV with this technology. So thanks. Thanks, Dan. We're now going to hear from uh, Tim Kelleher from Movia. Are we on? Are we on? Hello? All right. Um, do we have our video? Great. Thank you. So Movia um, is a technology company. We enable inertial sensing applications as well as gesture applications that run on the set-top box or or uh, internet enabled television. So looking at the stack here, um, this is definitely a purely technology based talk on my side here. Um, you see with, with, on the TV itself, I grab my mouse, uh, we, we operate in the orange boxes. So we offer a, what we call a smart motion server. This is a piece of middleware, so no user interface. I'll show you a demo here shortly where we put the user interface on top of it just to demonstrate its capabilities, but it's really middleware. And then on the remote control side, we have what we call our smart motion firmware, um, which converts your hand motion into either cursor motion or if you're doing gestures, as Dan was talking about. Uh, we also enable jitter reduction, some drift, drift reduction. I'll talk about some of the sensor types here in a minute and, and what that really means. Um, as well as we can do some of the gestures in the remote control itself. So moving to... demo. So what you see here is actually in the cube in the corner is a nine axis sensor. So when I talk about that, it's a three axis accelerometer, three axis gyroscope, three axis magnetometer. And that's representative of this little cube here. And you see as I move it in air, that top cube rotates as I rotate the, the device. Down on the bottom, you see implementations that use less than nine axis. So for instance, this one down here, three axis accelerometer, magnetometer, moving across, three axis gyroscope only, combine accelerometer and gyroscope, and then lastly, magnetometer and gyroscope. Why am I showing you all these? You notice how well the nine axis implementation tracks the motion. You see the rest of them doing funny things. For instance, the 3A, 3M, is very sensitive to magnetic interference. And so as I come across my, my laptop, it starts to fall apart very quickly. If I go back to my rest position, you see this one again comes right back, so it tracks it directly. Whereas down here, the gyroscope is drifted. It's just an unfortunate uh, physical property of gyroscopes. They drift within time and temperature change. So you compensate that typically with uh, an accelerometer, which you can get very good information about uh, tilt about gravity. But if you're going in the yaw direction or rotating about gravity, you have no information. And so what you see is yaw drift on this implementation. You see a lot of the remote controls that are out there today are either six or five axis implementations. So they don't combine the magnetometer. You'll get drift in the yaw direction in time. Uh, if you're navigating a program guide, not so important. If you're playing a game where you're wanting to track the motion for a long time, it's actually quite important. Your avatar could simply drift away from you. Um, same thing on the magnetometer. Instead of having drift about gravity, you have drift about the magnetic field. So that would either be a roll or pitch, depending on which way you want to hold your fingers. So. Uh, the reason why it's important, again, is back to the gaming, and, and this is where Movia adds value, is combining the three sensor types so that I can track very, over very long periods of time um, and relatively high speed, and I can come back to the, 
the table and I've got right back where I started. Right? So if you're playing a dancing game where you want your avatar to follow you, this is the type of, of application you'll likely end up needing to have. So that's what runs on the device. Let's now move to something on the set-top box. Sorry. So this takes a second to load. Uh, but so the, the concept here is not only do you need to track your motion for gaming or navigation applications, there's a lot of gaming applications where what you really want to do is recognize that a gesture was performed. Okay, so I have some very simple gestures over here on the side. This is my library, um, so I've just got the numbers and my signature. And so this is where uh, user authentication type application might be interesting. So what I'm going to do is, uh, just so everybody knows, this is a gyration mouse. Uh, Movia used to be the owner of this brand of Air Mouse. We recently have sold that off, but uh, that's what our, my demos are built around. So by pushing the gesture activation button and performing a gesture, whoops, try one more time. Of course, I'm going to have demo problems today. Well, maybe I won't demo this then. Up, move on? Okay. Anyway, so that engine is the gesture recognition engine. Kevin Shaw. Uh, I'm <laughs> waiting for uh, my demo to come up here. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kevin Shaw. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Sensor Platforms. I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking about advanced user interfaces. And when I say advanced user interfaces, I don't mean something available in the future. I mean something available here and now. I'd like to talk about the use of touch-based user interfaces. Now, most of you in the room probably have phones or tablets that are using this type of a touch-based system. It's my hypothesis that within some short period of time, many televisions will be using the exact same interface. Let me explain to you why. First of all, the touch-based interface has been massively successful. There have been over 100 million user activations in just the first three months of this year. For Android, that's over 35 million activations. This is a phenomenal number of activations for a relatively new product. Second of all, the same idea has been massively accepted by developers as well. The number of developers available right now is well over 10,000, and they've produced over 200,000 apps. Now this leads to the issue of revenue, ARPU, average revenue per user. These applications drive revenue for the developers, obviously, but they also drive revenue for the stores. For example, as evidenced by the Apple uh, App Store. That is driving revenue for these companies, also shown by the Google Marketplace, the Amazon App Store. These are mechanisms for driving revenue. Third, I'd like to mention the common interface. Now, I will argue that the same interface used on a phone has scaled remarkably well for the tablet. I argue that it will actually scale right quite nicely for a television. Now, how is this done? Well, and the picture here in the lower right, kind of hard to see, is a small box, an Android TV box. This box is remarkably similar to a phone, except that it doesn't have a touch screen. Well, hmm? want me to talk up? Okay is remarkably similar to a phone, except obviously no touch screen. Instead of video out going to a screen, it goes to a television monitor through HDMI. 
input comes through a mouse input. So as I'm moving my hand around here, I am actually driving a mouse input to the screen. This is remarkably similar to what Dan has just shown us uh, earlier and also with the gentleman from Movia. Same, very similar technology. But in this case, what I'm demonstrating is the ability to use it with Android, a touch-based system. Now, in this particular case, the remote that I'm using is using a free motion air touch technology, noted for the simple fact that it uses very low cost sensors. In fact, the same sensors that are used in most of the cell phones and smartphones that you have in your pockets right now. Second of all, it also has very long battery life, over a year on a pair of AA batteries. Thirdly, and very important, is the fact that it utilizes gestures. Now, we've always already seen some excellent demonstrations of gestures. I'm going to demonstrate the ability to bind that directly into Android. Now, what is it that Sensor Platforms provides? We don't sell remotes, but we do provide technology. So for a company that has a remote control, we provide the technology to make your remote a motion remote. Now, I just press a button here, and I am back in an Android interface. In fact, the presentation I just showed you is actually just an app running on Android. Now, this shows a standard sort of a, well, what you might see in a walled garden type approach, relatively uh, minimal functionality, but uh, very powerful. I have uh, an app here for Uverse, uh, Netflix, uh, the Xfinity from Comcast, uh, weather, uh, music, gallery, news. I can go up here and pull that up and show uh, EPG, that was, uh, shows me the content that's available right now and gives you an idea what uh, is available on TV right now. Now, do I need to do anything special in order to do this demo? No. I downloaded these apps off the App Store. They work the same way on the phone as they do on the tablet, as they do on the TV. No changes. More to the point, I'm not limited by what I see there. I have these apps and these. These are just some of the 200,000 that I could have pulled down. I just chose these for this demonstration. It seems to be somewhat required that I have to be able to show the ability to play Angry Birds. So I just thought I would pull this up here and there I have my little angry red bird and there we go. Take that, you evil little piggies. So what I've demonstrated here is the ability to take as existing apps and put them on a standard box. This is running plain vanilla Android 2.2 and be able to interface it with a motion remote. Now, I have more that I can do. It sort of goes without saying. I can look at Twitter feeds. I have my uh, Facebook account here as well. Shopping, music, YouTube videos, uh, Netflix, sports, news. Um, I have music, I even have the New York Times. I have full capability to do web browsing. If you can do it with your uh, phone, I can do it here on the TV without recoding. I'm gonna show you here simply a, a gallery here and show you the ability to go through here and slide through and look at photos. I can go and pull up a photo. This is something I envision that will become part of the family experience sitting in the living room going through family photos. Now, the, fam the final thing I want to demonstrate here, there's certainly a lot more that I could do, I have very limited time, is I just want to pull up movies. And in this case, I can go and see what are the latest movies, go and pull up the trailer for those and find out what's playing. In this case, I find out that Pirates of the Caribbean is getting panned. I was looking forward to seeing that, but I'll probably see it anyway. I have the ability here to see what's available exactly as I can on my phone. All I've done is added a simple motion remote to use it. So my final comments are, we've talked a lot today about revenue and the ability to drive it. What I'm proposing here is at least two ways to drive revenue from a system such as this, using an Android operating system with its very low cost, huge number of existing applications. For a provider that uses a system such as this, the ability to drive revenue through an app store or marketplace has already been demonstrated, and also the ability to drive revenue through video on demand. Both of these are drivers. 
And my final point, the ability to implement a phone-based system through TV with a touch interface is exemplified through a motion remote such as this, using the free motion air touch remote. I thank you for your time. Great. Thanks, Kevin. We're now going to hear from Rob Gerling from Artifact, and then we're going to jump into a Q&A with our panel. Rob? Hello. Um, I'm Rob Gerling from Artifact. We're a design consultancy in Seattle. Um, I don't have a technology demo. Um, the image behind you is actually um, just a talking point for me. Um, this is us doing um, user research on a on a connect con on the Connect controller prior to launch. So we helped Microsoft with that. Um, a lot of very talented people and a lot of very talented technologists went into the effort there. So I don't want to claim too much, but uh, we were took a small part in that um, in that design. Uh, we've been working at user experience for many years. Um, We've seen many platforms come and go. We were, a lot of us were involved in the early development of Surface, uh, which pioneered a lot of the touch controls uh, that we use. It's commonplace today. And I think one of the things that we see a lot is that when um, the new, uh, a new set of technology comes along, there's an immediate sort of version one, which is to take the paradigms of, of touch, and pointing and the cursor, and sort of bring them forward um, to, to sort of get to that playing field and some pretty compelling demonstrations of that here. Um, I think what I would like to do today is sort of look a little further beyond that version one kind of uh, uh, and look, look to the opportunity that's unique to television in the living room and the social context that is special there and think about some of those opportunities um, with this technology going forward. Great. Thanks, Rob. I have some questions for the panel, and then I want to leave a couple minutes for questions from the audience. But uh, my first question is, uh, viewers have been using remote controls to channel surf for about 50 years, and most people seem pretty happy with them. How much of a challenge is it to get uh, paid TV sub subscribers, uh, internet video users, to adopt uh, motion and gesture-based uh, navigation? I guess, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with that. I think um, with all uh, experiences, with all user experiences, there's inertia. Um, but we have actually had pointing interfaces um, in common use for close to th uh, 30 years. I mean, from uh, the mid-80s when the mouse came to the, uh, to the PC, we are now accustomed to point and click and, and essentially natural motion interfaces. I think um, we saw with the introduction of the Wii an extraordinarily rapid transformation from a um, hand, essentially a button-based controller uh, to a natural motion controller um, because it's all about how consumers um, can react uh, to an experience to a value proposition. And with motion, the fact is the value proposition is very clear. And as long as the design is done instinctively, um, it doesn't take a, a lot of uh, learning. But it is really important in this, as all of us think about this industry, you see every one of us talking about natural interfaces, the criticality is doing this holistically. You can't design a device independent of the user experience. You can't design a user experience independent of the device. If you bring all of those together and do it well, consumers will adopt it. Are over-the-top video providers like uh, Roku, Apple TV, Google TV, are they more likely to use motion sensing technology uh, than a cable or satellite provider? Can I answer that? Sure, Alice, please. <laughs> So um, cable TV companies and so on really are sitting on, on a pile of content and um, their, their goal is really to get consumers to access more and more and more all the time. It's not about the experience that the consumers get, it's about how much content they access. Um, so it's, it's not really, I think, segregating these companies into cables versus uh, other types of companies is not really uh, the right distinction in, uh, in our opinion anyway. Um, it's really about getting consumers um, to access more naturally, more intuitively so that they get everything that they want uh, at their fingertips uh, without frustration in the way to getting it. For all the panel, uh, how about the cost of adding this technology? Uh, if I'm a pay TV provider, uh, how much is it going to cost me to, to uh, add a motion, add motion sensing technology to a remote control or to deploy motion sensing cameras in a set top, um, you know, versus the, uh, you know, the current platform? How, how much of a challenge is the, our cost issues? 
Kevin. Well, I can, I can speak for us. I mean, in particular, we chose the sensors out of a, the smartphone for a reason. Uh, they're being sold by the hundreds of millions, and so we have cost drivers which are pushing the uh, cost down on those. Mm -hmm. uh, sensors are, you know, a fraction of a dollar at this point and keep the cost of these implementations at very low uh, adders. Uh, that's critical for some of these markets. You've spoken about Roku and Boxy and some of these. These are very cost sensitive markets. And so you have to keep the cost down in order to be able to drive this into the consumer market. And what's the way we're going to see, how would it be adopted? Uh, Iris, uh, in the United States, would we see a, uh, a Cisco or uh, Motorola add um, motion sensing technology to a set-top? Would, uh, would an operator deploy it? Uh, would anyone like to answer that? Um, well, in a set-top box, I think probably um, would not be integrated. Usually set-top boxes are, you know, boxes that you put somewhere on the floor and you forget about them. Uh, probably the most uh, uh, natural way to, to deploy this uh, integrated would be into the television screen itself. Um, but actually, we are deploying today as, uh, as a standalone uh, sensor, which is situated just next to the TV, and that's also uh, acceptable to, to our customers. Um, and we'll see going forward how, uh, you know, as cost uh, uh, issues uh, rise and miniaturization uh, technologies and so on, how it's actually implemented and integrated into devices themselves. Mm -hmm. Dan, when will we see an operator uh, deploy a Hillcrest remote? Um, actually, I want to go back sure. to this, this other question. Okay. I think it's important um, that what we're doing, I think everybody on the panel is basically um, describing the fact that we're using standard interfaces, fairly simple interfaces. Essentially, um, in this device, it's emulating a mouse. So any device that can take a HID input, any USB um, type of input, you could just plug one of these in and immediately add motion. And it really doesn't matter if it's a set-top box, um, a set-top box or a a TV or, frankly, you know, um, a PC connected to a, a TV. That's actually an emerging area that uh, I think is, is pretty interesting for the over-the-top space. So from us, uh, we, we obviously launched uh, in January a fairly major initiative with LG. There's a television with an integrated pointer. Um, we, have, uh, we don't talk about uh, customers that are not announced. Uh, so I, I can't directly answer the question, but suffice to say that virtually every major TV OEM, every major set-top maker, and virtually every carrier is looking at bringing natural motion um, and uh, essentially the free space technology, our pointing technology, into their platforms. Okay, great. Can I, can I just... Uh, Please, Rob, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I think there's obviously this shift towards bringing the phone... Exp the three screens experience, basically, the, the phone experience, the laptop experience, and the 10-foot TV experience are all going to be the same experience in terms of a, it's, it's makes a lot of sense for app developers to create cross-platform content that way and distribute it through these same channels, through the same app stores. And so I think we're definitely going to see that sort of three-screen reality in, in the near future. I think the important thing from a user experience point of view is you sort of remember the uniqueness of the context. So just being able to play Angry Birds on all three platforms effortlessly isn't really the point. You have to take advantage of the fact that these things are actually different. And if you've got many axes of freedom, um, that that's actually a, a real benefit in, and the ability to potentially use speech and other natural forms of input to, to get rid of that typing experience. I mean, this 10-foot typing experience is just awful. I mean, I don't care. Any of your UIs here, I mean, you, you all recognize there's a terrible problem to solve with on-screen pointers, but, um, you know, why, why am I not speaking to the device? That's the more natural way to go. So I just, just the sort of heads up is to remember the, the uniqueness of the context and the uniqueness of the distance and the uniqueness of the interaction. Mm -hmm. Iris, what are, what are some of the technical challenges when it comes to... Uh, uh, you know, deploying motion sensing cameras, you know, I know lighting could be an issue, and what happens if uh, you have a family and, and more than uh, one person raises their hand to channel surf, who, uh, who gets to, uh, you know, drive the remote? Um, well, that's the equivalent of, you know, um, fighting over the remote control, but really, um, I, I think the biggest technolo technological challenge um, is finding the balance between getting the right experience on the screen and making it still 
intuitive and natural enough. So you want to be able to access everything that you need to access, but you still want it to be natural. You still want it to be you know, that lean back experience where you sort of lay back on your couch um, and you know, hardly raise your hand. So it's, it's finding that balance, finding the, the right type of UI that connects the TV to your gestures, to your emotions and so on. And when you find that, then the problem of fighting over the remote control is non-existent anymore because once you have control of the television, whether it's by doing this or this or waving your hand or whatever paradigm you choose to use, then you have control over the television. And until you relinquish control, then nobody else can take it. So um, it's, it's a matter of finding the right type of interface to the television. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure, go ahead, Dan. I think we have to be careful, um, and I think uh, Rob said this well, it's, it's really, we got to be not Maslow here and say if we're a hammer, we see all the world as a nail. Um, the, the whole idea is that you're hearing from all of us on the panel that um, there's a new way to interact with television. I think, Steve, you, the original question of the, the 50 button remote, that, that's the message we want to get across, that we've got to get rid of the 50 button remote control. Um, once we get rid of the 50 mo button remote and we sort of break from that, that paradigm, deciding which one of these natural input technologies is appropriate is going to become fairly simplistic. Um, if you're doing something where you have to surf the web or you have to have a lot of objects on screen and you have fine precision, you might want to use a free space technology. If you want to be in an immersive game, you're probably then going to want to use a camera-based um, type of technology where you can really get into it and the, and the experience, the game can see you and, and, and you can be part of it. Um, if you want to obviously um, enter text quickly or you want to communicate with somebody, then voice is going to be natural. So what's important from, a, from the industry's perspective is we come to the end of the line of the 50-button remote control. Okay. Tim, you actually... Uh, if, if I could chime in on that, I, I absolutely agree with what Dan's saying. Uh, I often tell the story that in the, the days of DOS, one controlled a computer with a 104-key keyboard. Then we switched over to far more advanced operating systems like what we have now. And how many buttons do we use to control it? We use a two-button mouse. And we've had a whole revolution, renaissance, in what computers can do. Yet we still have televisions that are being run with 55-button remotes. I expect a flowering in television as we know it once we ditch these 55 buttons and go down to far simpler interfaces. Tim, you have a, a product deployed in France with uh, Freebox. Um, they began using your motion sen sensing technology in their remotes last year. What kind of response have you seen from viewers? So uh, Free, Freebox announced it in, uh, was it November? Started rolling it out in January. Had a huge uptake. Several hundred thousand subscribers signed up in the first three months. Uh, they are a technology leader in the industry. You know, so they're always out first, and they innovate in the field. So the initial rollout has a very simplistic use of 2D pointing, uh, really just program, gu program guide. We're going to start seeing rollouts of newer features. I probably shouldn't say what they are, but definitely much more exciting uh, applications coming out on, the, on that box in the, in the coming months. We saw a, uh, a demo this morning of how a, uh, an iPad could be used to uh, uh, manipulate characters in a, uh, in a TV program. Um, I want to ask all of you, what, you know, what potential um, you know, futuristic uses do you see for motion sensing technology, especially incorporating, incorporating it in, uh, in, in interactive TV programming? I think we, we could actually spend the entire another panel on this yeah. topic. Um, but let's imagine, we, we've done a lot of experiments with advertisers with telescoping ads. The idea of being able to uh, click, um, you know, on um, objects and uh, essentially move to an advertising model. One of the things that was talked about this morning is this idea that can you overlay or not? Is it legal? Well, the fact is, you can actually build essentially a U-type interface where you don't impinge on the um, video at all. You put a pointing or an interactive U around the video and allow uh, consumers to interact. Imagine uh, the Madden effect, where you could literally circle an object in live and draw uh, an object on it and, and share that kind of um, interface or that kind of art with a friend of yours who's watching the game with you. So I, it's, it's an enormous possibility once you bring a natural interface uh, to the experience. The issue has to be, it's got to be quick, easy. The consumer has to just pick it up and do something instinctive and not learn a whole new mechanism 
of control in order to make these experiences happen. Okay. It's also nice if they're using the same device. So if they've got their iPhone, they're already doing a, either a touch screen or they're watching secondary video, to have that smartphone that soon most all of them will have nine axis uh, inertial sensors inside of them to simply switch to a different mode. Now I'm playing a game, I can make a gesture, I can draw, I can switch back and type. Right, so mm -hmm. the typing problem is a huge problem. Text is gonna be tough, but people have learned how to text. Uh, it's natural on your phone, it's something that you accept. And you have that screen that's local, so that actually solves part of the problem is that now I can, I don't have to look at 10 feet away to see what I'm typing, I have it local. Mm -hmm. So having that one device, I think really does uh, enable a lot of features that, that we haven't thought of yet. Great. Iris, if everyone has a motion sensing camera in, in front of their TV, what can you what can you do with that? Yeah, so at PrimeSense, so we're exploring new ways uh, for monetization opportunities um, without active participation of the user. Um, so just imagine that the sensor um, can actually see a room full of people um, in a depth map, as I was showing before, uh, and it can actually see, see um, who's looking directly at the television, who's paying attention, how many people are there, are they adults, are they children, um, rating opportunities, for instance, um, advertising, uh, uh, our sensor can uh, determine if the viewer is a child and which advertisements are appropriate, age appropriate for a child or not, uh, if it's a couple, for instance, well, various types of op options you can uh, imagine. Um, so uh, advertising opportunities are endless. You, are you thinking about a t-commerce application where uh, I could stand in front of my TV and get measured for a suit? Is that yeah, that's something okay. actually that's uh, definitely uh, in motion. There are several mm -hmm. companies working on that, um, and uh, I think you know we, we've seen a lot of uh, demonstrations of that around uh, uh, virtual shopping with various degrees of, of success. Um, the main thing here is again to get the experience to be as fun and as comfortable um, and as accurate as possible because it's not enough when you're shopping to just have a suit on you if it's not exactly contoured to your body. So it has to be um, accurate according to the sensor. It has to feel right, it has to be fun, it has to be a good experience. So it's not, it's not simple. Rob, you have any concerns about how the technology could be used and uh, any uh, you know, backlash that these providers might see by, from rolling it out? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not especially concerned about, about that, although there's a, some fun phenomena going on, on on Xbox Live with Kinect which is if you play games there, you'll actually hear um, what's going on in other people's living rooms who are unaware that the Kinect microphone is always on. Um, and this is like a really common phenomenon. So you're just sort of eavesdropping into everybody else's living room and you can hear all sorts of things that you're probably not supposed to hear. So there's definitely things to be aware of there that you know, having a camera facing you with a microphone is not a benign thing <laughs> in terms of like a, you know, it, what that means potentially for uh, abuse. I wonder how long it'll be before somebody hacks the Xbox and uh, allows people to spy in other people's living rooms. I, I, I don't imagine that's actually a very te technically difficult thing to do. So there are definite concerns to be aware of there, but um, I, think, you know, I think we'll successfully manage to overcome those challenges as we, we seem to always do. We, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. I'd like to take some questions from the audience if anyone uh, has questions for the panel. Yes, sir. You talked about uh, 2D versus 3D in the usage. I wonder if there's a difference in 2D versus 3D. I wonder if there's a difference in 2D versus 3D in the sensor. As I've watched all of you use your sensors, you have a little palsy there, okay? It does wiggle. And when I use my mouse on my desktop, it doesn't wiggle. When I hold it still, I don't have to hold it, right? It just sits there is a 2D, and I'm thinking of an example where I'm using my hand to move my program guide. You know, this is Tom Cruise and Minority Report. If the sensor is measuring in 3D, is it gonna be more susceptible to, you know, artifacts on the screen, apologies to the company, versus 2D where it's just measuring linear, left and right, up and down? I'll, I'll, uh, I can take that. Um, first of all, mo all of these technologies and, um, you know, generally have a trade-off between accuracy or precision as, um, and then sort of the noise, the noise effect. Um, you obviously want to track very small motions. Um, we call it the difference between tracking intended motion versus unintended motion. 
uh, you really shouldn't take this experience as an analog for how this works in the living room. Um, free space technology has very sophisticated um, you know, uh, algorithms to track human tremor and separate the intended motion from the unintended motion. Today, most of the experiences that we're um, demonstrating are 2D or sometimes 2.5D, um, and the accuracy and precision of these interfaces, uh, the, certainly the free space technology is, is ideal for that um, 2 to 2.5D. The sensor that we have here, this is a, a full 9-axis sensor, um, and we can uh, track in 3D as well, but we're not yet, you know, as an industry, ready to take, go away from the 2D uh, presentation layer to a 3D presentation layer. When we do, these uh, sensors will be more than uh, capable of tracking in 3D at, at high accuracy and being able to manage a user experience um, that is, you know, that's very easy and, and effective. Yeah, so the, it's not that the physics is different. That's the, the important part, uh, 2D versus 3D. It's really in the algorithms that you're using to compensate for jitter, uh, again, intended motion versus unintended motion, uh, or environmental changes, right? So if you're in a, in a highly magnetic field near your, your speakers, for instance, you need to compensate for that. And so that's what, uh, that's, or for instance, what we spend most of our energy on is algorithms for using the, the different sensors Great. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Um, in terms of using motion with other age groups, do you find or have you seen research saying that uh, older demographics would have equal acceptance of motion technology? You know, they haven't necessarily gone full steam ahead with motion on Xbox and Wii, things like that, although they're fun factors. Do you see a lowest common denominator that would need to be made for handicap accessibility, age, things like that, or is that not a barrier? I'm, I'm glad you actually brought that up. Um, turns out in, uh, for years of testing, we've actually done a lot of user testing, and interestingly, elderly people have tons of problems with 50-button remote controls. They can't see the labels and they can't, with the arthritis, push the buttons. Um, by moving to a two-button interface, uh, we were able to demonstrate that people as old as 90 were able to effectively use a full program guide, um, search for content, and uh, use the experience, um, as well as going the other direction all the way down to children who just love it and sort of to them it's a toy. So, and it's something that's natural, the, the use of a, a mouse or a finger. Uh, so I, I think actually you're going to find that if we move away from the 50-button remote, we're going to widen the age range of usage, not narrow it. Great. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Sorry. Thanks. Hi, thanks. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of very similar technology that was demonstrated earlier today. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what's the state of the intellectual property in this space? Are there expensive licenses that a, you know, a service provider is gonna need to pay in order to use this? Um, is there sort of some questions about who owns it at this point among the vendors in the space and, and where does that kind of head in ultimately? Thank you. Okay. Anyone, I know. Uh, I, uh, oh, let, let me take that, um, you know, uh, from our perspective, we've been in this uh, for 10 years. Uh, we, Hillcrest has filed an enormous amount of intellectual property centered around the design of inertial-based devices and the use of those devices uh, for, um, for user interface and, and applications. But I think, um, and you know, there are other folks on the panel say, who will say the same thing. They've developed a lot of IP um, and uh, you know, they've got patents and the like. I think if you ask all of us and you put us all in a room, um, the reality is that what we want to do is move away from intellectual property being the guiding light of this uh, space to, to technology. Uh, let the best technology win, um, you know, and, and ultimately for us, the way uh, we, you know, our customers get access to our intellectual property is to buy our software. Likewise, I think the, the same thing goes for, for other panelists, other companies. Um, but we do, we want to move to a place where um, it's natural, it's, it's very easy and there's, there's easy access. Uh, to the, the technology, and uh, we've made it easy for our customers uh, to take advantage of this technology, um, this IP essentially, by, uh, uh, by purchasing and licensing our software. And it's quite economical to do that today. 
if I could just that's the same model we use as well just guess one last quick question just in terms of uh, how can you some of you are competitors but how can you work together uh, how can you uh, Rob how can a company like artifact help design a better interactive program guide would you team up with a company like Rovi or uh, or Hillcrest and anyone on the panel how do you uh, how could you team up and work with each other well uh, yes okay. to the EPG <laughs> um, I think actually just point just to that point uh, quickly you know we see a lot of um, electronic program guide like UI um, I think again the opportunity is to get beyond that kind of straight port what you would see on a tablet um, and actually have uh, a really good metaphor for that's aligned to the physicality of these technologies um, start to exp start to uh, appear such that you know it's not just scroll through things but like actual spatial gestures are being used and um, and you know perhaps I'm browsing through a catalog of of clothing and being able to sort of select things and an actual actual alignment of my gesture with the uh, with the desired outcome um, so we'll see some really uh, exciting stuff coming from the gaming world that can be extrapolated out to all of the apps that uh, these platforms will be supporting Kevin I think the most enabling factor would be uh, advances in the uh, interfaces themselves. You know, I, I think there is plenty of uh, applications, plenty of markets for all of the people sitting here on, on the stage. Uh, it's just a question of having interfaces that work well with the technology that's being provided. We've been sort of stuck in the, the medieval, uh, medieval ages with these old up, down, left, right interfaces. And I think once we move beyond that, I think we'll see a flowering, a renaissance, and all of these, and I think all of us will, uh, will do well in that case. Great. Well, on that note, we're out of time. Uh, thanks for attending the panel. Uh, let's give a hand to our panelists and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.